Hi again. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, let me start off with like a broad overview again of uh, where all this is going and what I want to be talking about or what I'm interested in talking about. Um, as I go along, I will uh, maybe review some of the things we did yesterday just so that it's, it's, uh, it's fresh in your mind because it was uh, a lot of stuff that I went through really fast. Um, and so I'll try to review things uh, 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 as we go along. Um, but in some sense, you know, uh, the, the, the point of yesterday's talk was that uh, the basic principles of uh, statistical mechanics, which are things like fluctuation dissipation theorems, which you all know and love, in some sense constrain uh, the efficiency uh, with which cells can process information or cells can make measurements. That's sort of what I wanted to uh, uh, basically convey. Uh, and we did that in the context of uh, a particular model that, William, that Bill Bialik uh, first worked out. Um, uh, but, but the basic point was that uh, you know, no, matter, no matter what you do, as long as you're in equilibrium, uh, you have to uh, pay a cost, and the cost is determined mind by uh, this, this fluctuation dissipation relation, um, or, or in other words, the, co the cost is determined by the kind of fluctuations that inform Einstein's relation. Okay? Um, so in today's talk, uh, in, the, 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 in the first lecture that I'll give today, uh, I'll sort of build upon uh, an extension of that idea, and what I'm going to be trying to ask, what I'm trying to ask now is, what happens uh, to systems as they go out of equilibrium? Um, can we actually improve the bound? Uh, uh, you know, can we do much better? Can we improve the, uh, the efficiency of information processing if you happen to go uh, far from equilibrium? And those are the things that I want to head towards. Um, and I find this is a, I find, uh, you know, before, before going there, I find it useful to just think about landscapes. Uh, but, and by landscapes, I just mean free energy surfaces or phase diagrams. So this is a phase diagram or phase diagram of this sort. Uh, you know, this is something that we're all very familiar with. Uh, you know, uh, when we do th basic thermodynamics, we know, you know, we, we sort of draw out uh, uh, an axis for pressure, an axis for temperature, and we know that for liquids and gases and solids, uh, we can turn these two knobs and uh, we can get the kind of phase behavior we want. Okay, so, so, so by turning the pressure knob and the temperature knob, we can place the system in various parts so we can get different kinds of behaviors. And in equilibrium, we know how to get this. We know, we know, uh, we know what to do in order to get to the state we want. And it's sort of, you know, there's still a lot of mystery here. There's still a lot of stuff we can do, uh, you know, going into intricacies of the phase diagram, but we basically understand the framework um, that, uh, that informs such organization. Uh, we also, uh, know something about dynamics, and this is what we spent most of our time yesterday talking about. We know that uh, if I look at things like the diffusion constant in equilibrium, the diffusion constant is proportional to the temperature. This is, this is Einstein's relation. This is my poor attempt at a, you know, this is just a simulation of a Brownian random walker. Um, and if you were to measure the, the, the diffusion of this random walker, you'll find that it's proportional to uh, a, a number that I've put into the, to my simulation that's, that, that, that's just my temperature. In some sense, this is also uh, a manifestation or a Restatement of the fluctuation dissipation relation, and and uh, we know that you know everything that we need need, need to know about dynamics is contained effectively in uh, uh, in in, uh, in in relations of this sort. Okay, so th this is what happens in equilibrium, um, and as I alluded to yesterday, um, the question that we, we we want to ask is what happens if we now. Uh, you know, go out of equilibrium. So again, in equilibrium, uh, if you want to figure out the probability of, of attaining a certain configuration, and these are really abstract images, I just wanted to sort of say, you know, these 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 circles uh, denote for me some kind of configuration, um, and uh, over here I have the negative log of the probability. Um, and you know, in equilibrium, if you give me a free energy or if you give me an if, if you give me an energy, I know that the Boltzmann distribution or the Boltzmann form holds, and using the Boltzmann form, I can basically work out the probability of achieving various kinds of conf uh, configurations. Again, there's a lot to do here in that there's, there's, a, there's immense complexity in computing these partition functions or these, uh, or, or, or these free energies, but still we sort of understand how to go about doing these things. Okay. Uh, the question is now what happens if you go out of equilibrium? And I'll keep using, uh, I'll keep using circles to, to, to denote out of equilibrium. Um, uh, maybe not in this uh, talk, maybe the, the talk today afternoon, I'll sort of spend some time talking about why I keep you know, bringing circles in whenever I talk about non-equilibrium forces. It's, a, it's something, uh, it's, it's a useful exercise to do and I'll do that. But for now, uh, you know, whenever I think about non-equilibrium forces, I'll sort of imagine or I'll sort of draw out circles of some sort and you'll see me draw out arrows or circular arrows. And it's, it's, just, to say that it's, just, it's just to say for now that there are some kind of fluxes. 
Okay, so when you go out of equilibrium, you are creating some kinds of flows, you no longer have static quantities, and that's what this is meant to represent. And uh, the question is, what, how, how is this landscape modified? Uh, can we predict how it's modified? Can we control how it's modified? Um, and can we actually use these non-equilibrium forces to do something? You know, uh, to do something uh, clever with the landscape. In the context of information processing, uh, especially in, for biological systems, uh, the question we can ask, given what we did yesterday, was, you know, let's say we go out of equilibrium, let's say we go to this non-equilibrium regime, uh, can we take the bounds that we derived or we, we worked out yesterday that only depended on things like the diffusion constant, uh, the rough size of the, of the receptor, um, and, the, and the mean concentration, that's all it depended on. Um, uh, you know, can those bounds be modified if I start going out of equilibrium? So that's that's where I want to uh, start. You know, go to and I'll try to give you an overview of how people think about these things. Okay. Um, okay. So so this, this is where we left yesterday, and this is a, a good starting point. Again, uh, you know. Um, uh, what I have here is, uh, is, is one of the simplest and uh, one of the, the most well-studied toy models for information processing in, in biophysical systems. So I have here a DNA polymerase or a caricature of a DNA polymerase. It's sort of marching along. Uh, it's marching along a DNA strand, and uh, it has, you know, the, 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 what it wants to do is it wants to replicate the strand and, you know, hopefully create uh, a good replica of, of, of the strand over here. Okay, um, and uh, as we as we discussed yesterday, you know, uh, I have uh, in in this in this in this box over here, the enzyme can either add the right base pair. So in this case, uh, because I have the residue A over here, it, the, the 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 correct. Uh, 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 replica is going to have a residue T. That's the, that's the base pair that has the lowest energy. That's the most favorable thermodynamic state. Um, and so this is the this is the desired state. And this has you know a lo so I've drawn out what looks like an energy surface again. And this has a lower energy. Um, and obviously there are also undesired outcomes. You could have mistakes that that emerge. You could have wrong base pairs that show up over here. And if uh, you know these have higher energies. And let's say this delta is is sort of a uh, uh, a difference between the 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 energy of the of the right base pair and the energy of the wrong base pair. Okay, and these and these Gaussians that I put here basically are meant to denote that at least in equilibrium, the probability of finding a desired base pair is higher. So that's why I have, I have, I have a fatter Gaussian. Uh, and over here, the 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 probability of find, finding the under, undesired base pair, at least you know, if, if you just happen to count, is is lower. And that's why I have like a more shallow, a smaller uh, probability distribution. Okay. Um, so, so if if we go through and if we do, you know, our simple equilibrium analysis on this on this DNA polymerase uh, uh, enzyme, uh, there's a difference in energies between the desired and the undesired base pair, and, and the difference is delta. And so we can expect just from very simple Boltzmann considerations, and this is something we just, we, we, we discussed yesterday, um, we can expect an, an error rate which is proportional to the exponential of this of this energy difference. Okay, uh, and usually this works out 10 to the power of minus four, but what happens in biology is uh, is that you end up getting an error rate that is uh, is much much lower than 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 this than the, than this number over here. Okay, so 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 in in so in some sense you should think about this this expected error rate as some sort of an equilibrium landscape. Uh, and what what seems to happen in biophysical systems, and this has been experimentally determined or de demonstrated, is that uh, you know this this DNA, DNA replication process is almost always an active process. It consumes energy, um, and by consuming energy, it's able to lower the error rate from this number uh, to a number that's that's that, that that's that's uh, you know uh, that that uh, ensure that information is transmitted in a much more accurate manner. Okay, so, so, so going from here, so if you think about this as an equilibrium landscape to something like this, which is basically a non-equilibrium landscape, something that biology seems to accomplish. It seems to do it at the cost of some sort of energy. Um, and the question is, what are the design principles uh, that, that, uh, uh, that govern uh, such a transformation? How do you go from this equilibrium to, to, to non-equilibrium? And uh, also, you know, given all the time you know, I and Juan spent talking about information, uh, channel entropy, mutual information, does biology really care about bits? Okay, so you know, if I want to go from here to here, uh, I've told you that the system consumes some amount of work. It, you know, it needs to consume some chemicals and do and do all its things. Uh, is that chemical energy related in any way uh, to to these information theoretic measures that 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 we spent most of our time uh, uh, on uh, in, in in yesterday's lectures? So so that's what I'm going to address. Um, so. 
the way the way this is going to work is I'll first um, you know in, instead of going into the instead of going into a specific model for for this process and, th and this process is called uh, kinetic proofreading. Uh, one of the uh, sort of assignments or problems that I have is based roughly on this caricature. In fact, you sort of have the same figure in the in the in the, in the suggested readings. Um, and uh, this process is called kinetic proofreading. It's a very well studied uh, biochemical process. Instead of going into uh, kinetic proofreading and into, uh, into into the details of the specific thing, what I'll do first is I'll use this as an excuse to talk about the more general question about you know transforming equilibrium landscapes to, to non-equilibrium landscapes. To talk about how uh, ideas like uh, Mutual information or relative entropy show up. Um, I'll then I'll then sort of deal. I'll, you know, for for the most part of the first lecture, I'll talk about a set of theoretical models in which these ideas, you know, hopefully become become clear. And then we'll come back to proofreading uh, and and end with how uh, bi biology actually uses all these ideas to to ensure uh, accurate uh, uh, error correction. Okay, so that's sort of that's the rough structure of what how, how we're going to do this thing. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, so so the the kind of um, uh, picture or the or the simple setup that I want to sort of think about, or a, or a more abstract setup setup that I want to think about is let's say we have uh, let's say we have uh, two kinds of balls or two kinds of alphabets, and I have red and blue over here, um, and I have some kind of a Hamiltonian that that describes the interactions with, between the monomers. Again, this is you know you, you can map all this onto the proofreading kind of example. In this in this in the proofreading case, e equilibrium would be something that sort of tells you how the ligands talk to each other, right? And that's that sort of what or it's it's a, this e equilibrium is some kind of an energy function that has all the information uh, about how red uh, interacts with red and red interacts with blue and so on and so forth. Again, you know in 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 an analogy with proofreading, you can basically imagine that uh, you know red likes red, uh, blue likes blue, and any bonds between red and blue are bonds that look like error bonds. Okay, as, as we as we go in, that's sort of one useful thing to have in mind. So so let's say we have the Hamiltonian, and let's say now I um, I come in and I grow the system uh, very slowly, and and I'll I'll define what I mean by grow very uh, in in a few minutes. But let's say I have all these in solutions, and somehow I I grow uh, an assembly of some sort very slowly. Uh, in the context of this proofreading example, the growth would be just one dimensional. You would have all these things floating around in solution, and uh, you know you have this template strand, and you have things you know, that, that come and deposit on the template strand. And if 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 things happen very slowly. Uh, if, if 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 that can be controlled, then you expect, and if there is no other active process involved, then you expect that the kind of structures, the compositions that are formed, are going to be governed uh, entirely by uh, you know the free energy or the partition function that corresponds to this Hamiltonian. So this is what we know. You know this is something that's very very well known. Uh, I don't have to talk about this more. But what if we start? What if this whole thing happens fast? Okay, so it can happen, um, and again, I used fast. I I I, I use the word fast um, interchangeably with far from equilibrium. Um, I could do a far from equilibrium process that is slow. I could do a far from equilibrium process which consumes chemical energy and you know happens slowly. Uh, but you know, for now, I'll sort of mix the two up. I'll 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 say fast and far from equilibrium, um, you know, almost interchangeably. And so, what happens if I do this process uh, uh, far from equilibrium? Uh, one way to do it, and this is this, there are many ways to do this, but one way to do it, let's say, is you know, let's say I have um, all these things in solution, and uh, you know, we go from very standard thermodynamics that uh, I can tune something called a chemical potential, which is related to the concentration of these of these of these things in solution. And if the if the concentration is very high or the chemical potential is is very favorable, then the whole thing is going to you know want to condense and form the assemblies that it, you know. Uh, Form some kind of assemblies, and uh, if I tune this number, and if I, if it's a very large number, if there's a large supersaturation, uh, this is what happens if you have a large you know concentration of of sugar in solution. You sort of form crystals really fast. Um, you you end up forming uh, you end up forming configurations or, or things that look no, no longer look like this. There's a lot of disorder here. There's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of error that sort of creeps into this. This is in some sense the opposite limit of the proofreading idea that I've been talking about. But still, I mean, I'm growing this fast, and you get something that is no longer uh, you know you get you get a landscape that is that is nowhere uh, uh, like the landscape that you get if you, if you happen to grow this thing uh, uh, very slowly. And these things. These things also happen in chemical physics and you know in uh, in chemistry and physics a lot. Um, so there's non-negligible growth rate. These kind of things happen if you think about uh, 
uh, diffusion limited aggregation. Uh, these, these happen if you want to think about how dendrites grow out on the surfaces of batteries in many, many different contexts, in crystal growth, many different contexts to sort of have uh, patterns that form that are very different from the patterns that um, are uh, that are preferred by this by the by the interaction Hamiltonian of the of the system. Okay, um, and uh, the question that we try to ask is, uh, or the question that the the, the 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 big picture question that we can we can try to ask is, so let's say we start off with uh, with some uh, set of Hamiltonians or some set of um, uh, some set of interactions. Uh, I'll call them E equilibrium. And again, in the context of the, in the biochemical context, these would be uh, the interactions that uh, uh, these would be how the monomers talk to each other, or, or how the base pairs uh, talk to each other. Um, and if I and if this happens to and if I if I take this through some kind of a non-equilibrium process, in this case, the non-equilibrium process I've imagined is one where the concentration is high, and so you have a lot of defects. You could imagine other non-equilibrium processes in which you have enzymes coming in and doing some active things, and you know uh, maybe changing this in different ways. Uh, the question is, what can we say about um, the the structure and composition of things that 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 show up inside, and uh, can we use non-equilibrium forces to actually control the structure and composition of things that, uh, that show up inside? Usually this is a very tough question. It depends on kinetics, it depends on everything. But just like, just like we did before, what I, what I want to try to argue in the next few minutes is you know, just like we sort of worked through the fluctuation dissipation bounds and, and showed that uh, fluctuation dissipation, relation, fluctuation -dissipation uh, theorem constrains the, the error that's, that's propagated through a biophysical channel, even over here, it turns out that uh, uh, even though the process is kinetic, there's no free energy of any sort, one can actually uh, uh, still come up with reasonably good design principles uh, for, uh, for, for the kind of structures that are formed. And, and uh, you know, an essential element uh, that's, that's important in all this is uh, our, our, our culprits that we sort of uh, saw yesterday. You know, you see that elements that uh, are, uh, uh, you, see this, uh, you see that there's a relative entropy-like term, and these kinds of terms uh, that we introduce from an information theoretic perspective show up over here, and they allow us to uh, 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 make very good guesses for the kinds of structures that are formed if you start consuming energy. So, uh, I put a lot of stuff up here right now. Let me let me go over this slowly, uh, and I'll maybe draw something on the board for a, for a minute. So uh, what I have here, and again I want to go back to um, go back to how uh, we set up set up the problem for the in the proofreading case. So I have two kinds of blocks. I have red blocks. I have red blocks and blue blocks, and I can't go too close to the board because it's not coming out. So I have two kinds of blocks. I have red blocks and blue blocks. Um, and and uh, and let me imagine that uh, you know I, w I have these these blocks floating around in solution, and uh, each time each time a, a red and a blue come together, you know this this represents something like an error state. Okay, so so this this represents a, it represents a state in which the bond is not uh, is not the bond that's thermodynamically favored, and it's a bond that's sort of you know different from um, it's different from what's allowed uh, thermodynamically. So 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 this this would be an error state. To my cell phone. Let's put it over there. So this would be my error state, and uh, you know, let's say the probability of seeing errors when you just have the native interactions. Let's say the probability of seeing errors is uh, is is eta equilibrium. So this is the probability of seeing an, an error. Uh, so this is the probability of having an error, and this depends on you know the interaction strengths that, as, as we discussed, and the probability of not having errors uh, in a bond. Is one minus eta minus q. Okay, so so I have the system, and in the absence of anything else, uh, it's sort of it's it's going to it's going to it's going to sort of form its assembly. Uh, 
you know, uh, every so often you're going to have a bond that is, uh, you know, that has the wrong kind of, uh, uh, that is the wrong kind of pairing. It's going to be a pairing between red and blue, and the probability of seeing such bonds is going to, is going to depend uh, is going to depend on uh, this 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 object which I've called eta eq. Okay, uh, so that's what I have here. And now let's say that I drive the system out of equilibrium. Um, in the let's say context that we were talking about, uh, I do this by having a very high chemical potential. So I, I have I have some kind of a, I have I have some kind of a, a pump that maintains the concentrations at a very at a very high level. Whenever um, a B or, a, or an R gets added to this to this uh, to the system. The pump does work on on, on something, and it uh, it injects another molecule into the into the bath around. Okay, so so, so that's so that's what I mean by uh, you know uh, by, by the condition that I have a high concentration. Okay, so so if uh, if if I if I let this assembly grow, it's going to it's going to usually consume all the molecules around it, and it's going to sort of re reach a steady state. But if I have some kind of a pump that that constantly maintains concentration, this pump has to keep doing work. Okay, and this 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 object that I have over here, this object delta mu, uh, which is which, which which I called an excess chemical potential, in some sense is uh, is the amount of work the pump has to do per molecule in order to maintain the concentrations at a constant level. Okay, so in some sense, this pump keeps uh, you know keeps pumping energy into the system. It, it maintains the con the concentrations at a at um, uh, at at a steady state. The amount of energy the pump has to pump into the uh, that has the, the pump has to expend is going to be related to. I shouldn't drop this off. Um, the amount of energy the pump has to um, has to put out is going to be related to the rate at which this assembly is growing. That's my d and dt. Uh, times delta mu, and uh, so this is the amount of this is the amount of energy the pump has to keep uh, expending if the system has to grow at a rate given by d and dt, where n is the size of the assembly, uh, or this is the velocity of the growth, and delta mu is the amount of work that, that the pump does to sort of inject new molecules in. Okay, so that's that's the rough accounting that the, that we have over here, and this is the amount of work the pump is doing. Um, so what ends up happening in this in these kinds of uh, in this kind of system is so so I start off with this okay and let's say I I, I want to achieve a state uh, or let's say you know I don't know I don't know all the kinetics yet I don't I don't exactly know if there are enzymes over there I don't know what the rates of addition and removal are I don't I don't really need to know them let's say I want to go from this state okay which in which my uh, errors are. Uh, are distributed according to the distribution eta equilibrium. Uh, if I want to go from this state to a new state, in which the probabilities of errors are distributed according to some other number, according to some other number eta, the probability of errors is eta. The probability is of no error is one minus eta. It turns out that. Um, if you were to do an accounting, and I won't go through this uh, in this um, in this talk, uh, uh, you know, one of the assignment problems I've set out sort of goes through this accounting in some detail, and I'll give you some hints about that in the next lecture. So if you if you happen to go through an accounting for for all the heat fluxes and the heat losses, and if you convert all these heat fluxes to entropies, and if you require that the total entropy of the universe keeps increasing. Okay, so you go back to the second law and you, and you, and you, and you do, your, do your usual thing. So, so it's really textbook stuff. It's nothing, nothing fancy. Then you find that the, the total accounting of the entropy production for a process in which you consume this amount of energy, though the pump keeps putting out this amount of energy, this is your native equilibrium state that the system would, would, would want to go to, but is not able to do that because this pump is putting in this amount of energy, it goes to something else. It turns out that, you know, it turns out that for you, you know, for me to have a system uh, with eta equilibrium, eta and delta mu, I, I need to have, uh, if I were to take a system with these three quantities, and if I were to write down an expression for the total amount of entropy, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the rate of increase of the entropy of the, of the universe, so this is ds dt, uh, this, is the, this is the rate at which the entropy of the universe is increasing, this has to be greater than zero. Uh, ds dt turns out is what I have over there in the board. I'll just write it down again. dn dt delta mu So it's it's a bit cramped over here. I don't want to go here. I don't want to rub this off. Uh, but I have the same expression over here. Um, so this 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 entire thing, 
um, on, the, on the left hand side is nothing but an accounting of the total entropy change in the, in the, in the universe as, this, as the system is growing. It doesn't tell us anything about um, it doesn't tell us anything about, uh, about you know about the value that the system uh, attains for eta. Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about the growth rate the system attains. It merely tells us that if you have a, if you have some kind of a, a chemical pump or a mechanical pump that does work on the system and that amount of work is is delta mu times d and dt, uh, then in order for you to take the, the, the distribution eta equilibrium and transform it to some other distribution, uh, some other distribution eta, uh, you need to at least, uh, you know, you, you need this inequality, inequality to be satisfied. So in some sense, this, this inequality is nothing but the second law of thermodynamics uh, written, written in, this, in, this, in this fancy way, um, uh, you know, places constraints on the kind of structures that you can actually attain, uh, you know, if, if you start off with some eta equilibrium and if I give you delta mu, it places constraints on the kinds of compositions that, 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 are, that are potentially allowed. It doesn't tell you whether you'll, you'll reach them. It doesn't tell you how to reach them. It tells you that there's this huge boundary or it may be a small boundary. And, and we'll actually go into this. We'll, be, we'll work through an exactly solved model uh, with correlations and everything and, and all the bells and whistles. Um, but it gives you this, 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 this intuition for what you can do, for how you can actually take a system that, you know, like to be in a state like this, grow it fast, grow it out of equilibrium, have a rapid growth rate, um, and transform the distribution to something else. Okay, it tells you what's allowed. It doesn't tell you how to reach there, but it tells you what's allowed. Okay, and, and again, uh, someone had a question. Sorry, what? Yeah, so I'll come to that right now. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, so I wrote down uh, uh, over here. I have these p n's and all these omegas. Uh, you know, for now, uh, in the context of this this red blue model, uh, just think about. Um, just replace this this entire object by by what I have up here. Um, in the in the more in the more general context uh, where I have interactions or when I have longer range interactions between the particles, uh, p n for me uh, is uh, is an n particle distribution. Okay, and so if I have an n particle distribution, um, then it turns out that I can still write down the same kind of things over here. Everything is effectively single particle um, because I, I either have a have a have a have an error state or a state without an error. Uh, but but in but in general, I can sort of do these kind of manipulations with with a, with a, with a full n particle distribution. D uh, is the kullback labor divergence or the or the relative entropy between the n particle distribution that you get. Uh, in the growing state, and the n particle distribution that you expect to get of the system were not growing, um, and it's divided by n, and this whole thing is valid at the limit of large n. Okay, so that's that, that's how this thing works. You have another question? So, so this omega for me represents uh, a configuration, right? So, so in this case, there are no real structural changes. All the changes are in the compositions. But if this were a polymer that's fluctuating around, this omega would represent both the composition and the structure. And so it, it would sort of have it would it would encompass the whole state space. There are there are many issues here, or I you know there are some issues related to uh, defining objects like this for both structural and compositional fluctuations. There are some some subtleties, but for the most part it works out. You know. So um, so this omega over here uh, or this result is a more general result uh, in which omega represents uh, the uh, uh, a, a point in phase space. Um, and uh, for this, for the specific problem in which we just have errors or no errors, um, then this d, ob this this entire d over n object uh, reduces to this very simple form, and uh, and it tells us that um, you know if you were to write the second law, you get this thing. So the one thing I do I do want to point out is that you know yesterday we spent quite some time, both Juan and I spent some spent, spent quite some time talking about this object, the the cool black Libra divergence, and it has a very beautiful. Uh, information theoretic uh, interpretation it tells you something about the distinguishability between between two distributions right so so we went through this argument where we showed that if I have two distributions p and q um, and if I uh, if I want to be able to distinguish between those two distributions given uh, an ensemble of n samples this 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 cube the cube black Leibler divergence d uh, helps us do that it, it sort of tells you how distinct uh, you know it, tell, it gives you a measure for how many samples you actually need if you want to start distinguishing uh, the, you know the, the 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 two distributions p and q, and surprisingly, or rather mysteriously, you know, this uh, it shows up in a in a in a thermodynamic accounting. So in everything we did yesterday, we sort of had a, we had we only had information theoretic we had information theoretic uh, statements for distance and so on and so forth. And what seems to be happening over here is is, is that you know if you do a honest to god 
thermodynamic accounting and, and, and we'll, towards the end, I'll actually, I'll come back and we'll go through some of the details, but this is, I wanted to put this up here and talk about this for a bit. If you do an honest thermodynamic accounting of all the heat fluxes and think about entropies and everything very, very carefully, this object just pops up. Um, and this object, uh, you know, is an information theoretic measure of distance between the equilibrium state and the non-equilibrium state that you want to get to. And, and what the second law seems to be saying is that if you want to, to take this distribution and you want to force it to a new kind of distribution or a new kind of configurations, uh, the amount of cost that you have to pay, you know, that's the, that's the pump that you, that, 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 that you have to keep running, has to at least exceed this information theoretic measure of distance. Okay. Um, uh, you know, this you, one can one one sees similar structure emerging in many many different contexts. It emerges when you think about uh, things like uh, uh, you know, if you imagine what happens to a gas in a piston. If you if you if you take a gas in a piston and you and you squeeze it uh, very hard, uh, it turns out that this that this information theoretic measure of of distance is intimately related uh, to the amount of work that you're doing on the gas as you squeeze it very hard. And Juan has some beautiful papers on this where, where he sort of demonstrated that this information theoretic measure is, inter is, is, is intimately related uh, to thermodynamic measures of, uh, of, of dissipation. So, so there's, there's, there's a lot of work here that I can spend a lot of time on, but I just wanted to point out that uh, it is somewhat mysterious the way it emerges, at least the way, at least the way I've shown it right now. Uh, but, but these things do emerge, they, they sort of show up. Um, and uh, you know, if I think about this in the context of proofreading, you know, my delta mu is some kind of a chemical pump. So the enzyme goes in and it sort of does its job and it consumes energy. It sort of consumes some kind of a chemical pump. DNDT is the rate at which the system, the, the enzyme is able to proofread the polymer or, or, or extend the polymer out. And um, the minimum amount of cost the enzyme has to pay if you want to go from, uh, so we, we, you know, we wrote down these numbers. If you want to go from, um, an eta equilibrium of 10 to the power of minus 4 to an eta of 10 to the power of minus 8. Um, you know, this, uh, this, 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 this inequality over here uh, gives you a minimum cost the system has to pay in order to, uh, in order to take you from, uh, you know, uh, the state that's, that's allowed by thermodynamic or that's, that's allowed in equilibrium to this, to this non-equilibrium state. It doesn't tell us anything about the rate at which you, uh, you know, it doesn't tell us anything about the transport properties. Um, in fact, if you, want to, if you want to saturate this bound, if you want to uh, get a process in which this, the, this, this, this bound is, is exactly satisfied, it turns out that those processes have very, very slow growth rate. So uh, you don't want to saturate this bound. You want processes that actually go beyond this bound so that you can actually grow at a finite rate. Uh, and, we, and we'll come to all these things towards, uh, you, know, you know, later on. Uh, but uh, at least at a very simple level, you can sort of apply these ideas to proofreading. And, uh, uh, you know, you can sort of from this infer that biology does care about bits to a limited extent, because it turned, you know, if you measure this, this, this the, the, the delta mu that you get from this is actually a very small number. It's not, it's not close to what biology really expends, but it, but, but it does seem to signify that biology cares about bits. It cares about all the structures we, uh, we had yesterday. Yeah, but Ben and then Albion. Yeah. Um, but, but can you actually come up with schemes that achieve this bound? So, 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 so the scheme that, 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 that would achieve this bound would be a close to quasi-static scheme. Okay, so, so yeah, I think one can do it. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll talk about, uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, you know, extending this bound by, uh, by using uh, a very neat uh, extension of the fluctuation dissipation relation. And over there, it turns out that you can actually saturate the bound at finite growth rates. So I'll come to that in a few minutes. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, KBT. I, I messed up. I, I don't have factors of beta inverse yeah. all, all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So everywhere you find that I use delta mu, it should be KBT uh, or, or beta delta mu. Uh, yeah, just think betas. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is general. So, so you can. Um, oh, I see. Um, so, so in, in this case, uh, you know, more broadly, you can imagine thinking of this as going from one kind of a steady state to a different kind of a steady state. If you do that, uh, then you might get a, a few other terms. But if you're in equilibrium, those terms vanish. Okay. So, so if you have, for instance, uh, a non-equilibrium state in which you, you know, you're, you're pumping the system and doing something, and you have eta one, and you want to go from eta one to eta two. Um, you might get a few few additional things. Uh, uh, if you're in equilibrium, those things drop out. So, 
Yeah, but this this the structure sort of seems to show up in many different uh, uh, contexts. So uh, this is just this is just just a way for me to complete the argument or complete the setup from yesterday. Biology does seem to care about bits. I haven't convinced you or I haven't shown you that it should or it doesn't. Uh, it, it cares about bits in a meaningful manner. But at least you know uh, this has. Uh, uh, built into this, this has a structure of mutual information, this has a structure of channel entropy, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, one can also apply this, one can also extend this idea um, to, um, to uh, uh, mutual information where you, where you have a template strand. So in, in, the, in, this, in this context, I've sort of talked about, I've talked about growing a simple polymer uh, to really make association, to really make the connection with proofreading, one has to talk about uh, uh, you know, a template strand and uh, think about the information transfer from the template strand to the strand that you want to get copy, uh, that you want to copy. It's, it, you end up with structures that are very similar to this. Uh, this result was first sort of written down, um, you know, uh, and this is a remarkable paper you should, it's, it's, it's a very nice read by, by Charles Bennett in uh, 1979, this is it's an obscure journal, Biosystems, uh, but you can find it, or if you don't, I can, I can send it to you. Um, and later on, other people sort of uh, rediscovered this, this result using uh, a more modern approach, but, 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 but Bennett basically had uh, this result for proofreading, and you know, he, he, he sort of uh, uh, tried to think very carefully about uh, ideas like Maxwell's demons and so on and so forth in the context of proofreading, and, and, and one already mentioned this uh, yesterday. Okay, so, yep. Sorry. Yeah. What model Exactly, exactly. So, so at this point, everything is model independent, right? I haven't told you anything about the rate of on and off. And in a few minutes, I'll, I'll come to that point. I'll sort of talk about, well, you know, what if we have data? What if I, what if I know the rate at which the thing is growing? Right? Can I put that in here and, I, and can I get an estimate that's much better? Right? So, so, so we'll do that in a few minutes and I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah? This thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, effectively, you know, sure. But, but the thing is that you know, uh, the so 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 let's say let's say I I have a, a, a an excess concentration. What's going to happen is I'm going to have a growth front constantly, right? So so I might I might end up with an eta inside, and I can take the log of the probability and, and, and call it something. But I'm going to have a growth front. So the system always has currents, and so I can't really think of it as an equilibrium system. Okay. Uh, and so, so that's, that's, that's the kind of setup I have. Now, if you think about it in the context of proofreading, uh, the currents are really slow, but, but, but they're, hidden in, they're, they're hidden in other variables. Like the, the rate at which the polymer sort of walks might be slow, but they're hidden in other variables that are not apparent uh, uh, you know, in, in, in this manner. They, they, they don't show up in D and DT, they show up in other, in other contexts. Uh, and so whenever you have these cycles, uh, I can take the log of a probability and call it a distribution, which I, which or, and call call it an energy, but uh, but it doesn't it doesn't have any it doesn't give me any, any information. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so in this case, uh, you know, the all my non-equilibrium stuff happens at the edge because it's growing. Okay, and and what I'll do, uh, and I won't do this, maybe not in this lecture, in the next lecture. Uh, I'll actually I'll put loops on all this, and I'll I'll, I'll talk about what happens then. Um, so, so in this case, you know, you know, uh, this delta mu that I have over here, uh, right now, it can come because of an excess chemical potential. If I put loops, then it comes because of those loops. So it comes because of some kind of circulation. Uh, in this case. What is being circulated in the model that I have over here is concentrations or molecules are being circulated. If you put loops, you are circulating through enzyme states, and that gives you your new, new driving force. And so it sort of shows up in different contexts, but it has a very similar flavor once you, once everything is uh, you know once all the dust settles. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, I, spent, I, spent, I spent a lot of time on this. Basically, this, the, 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 the structure over here is nothing but the second law of thermodynamics uh, uh, for non-equilibrium uh, self-assembly. And, and, and I've snuck this word in here. Uh, I, I, I like to think of these processes more broadly as self-assembly processes because you start from, from a nucleus and you're growing it out. And it looks like by using the second law of thermodynamics, you can actually get, uh, uh, you can actually sort of get information on bounds um, and you can, um, uh, you can hope to understand the kind of structures you get if you if you pay a particular cost. Okay, and applied to proofreading, it suggests that this 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 information which we thought about 
uh, from a very different perspective, which was introduced in the context of languages, uh, shows up here. This shows up here when you, when you start doing thermodynamics, and it has uh, it has a very uh, um, attractive meaning. Uh, it's 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 still mysterious, but it sort of has a very uh, uh, a nice flavor to it. It sort of helps you get your hands around things. Okay, um, so let me go back to uh, uh, let me go back to where I started uh, with this this with this caricature, and let me let, let let me do the 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 thing that someone asked me right now. Uh, I'll, let, let me sort of look in this one region, and I define these p of omegas. In general, these are probability distributions uh, for all the configurations that are allowed in here. And this is a sort of a messy object, but let let me say I can do it. I can sort of. You know, the system system is growing. I can look within the growth front, uh, and I can you know uh, tabulate all the configurations that that are allowed over there. And that histogram is denoted by p omega, and I can I can take the log of it, put a temperature scale up here, and I can call this an effective energy. This has no physical meaning. It it doesn't imply you know this this energy doesn't describe dynamics. It's just a statistical object. There's no, nothing beyond it. Similarly, I can. Um, I can describe, uh, you know, from this energy, I can describe an effective partition function. Again, this has no physical meaning. This is not a knowledge freedom free energy. This is just a statistical object that I'm defining for reasons that will become clear in a second. Um, basically, this E effective is a, is a different way for me to parameterize or think about the kind of compositions or the kind of structures that emerge. Uh, in the context of what we discussed right now, you know, if I take eta equilibrium and reduce it by a lot to a new value of eta, in, in a sense, I'm taking uh, the value of E equilibrium, which is 10 to the power of, uh, which is on the order of uh, 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 8 kT or something, and I'm, I'm, I'm converting it to E effective, which is on the order of you know, 16 kT. So I'm sort of doing that. That's the kind of setup I'm doing. And that's, that's, ex that's, that's the information that I want to convey with these, with these objects. So the reason I'm doing this is I'm just going to um, you know, rewrite what I had in a slightly different form, which, which makes my life easier. And it likes, it, it's just a different way of thinking about uh, all these, all these, all these ideas. So I start with e equilibrium and e uh, and g equilibrium, and I want to get structures that look like e effective and g effective. The system is still growing. It's, it's, it's. These are not, these are not um, energies. These are just statistical objects that help you characterize the kind of structures that emerge. And so, if I want, if I, if I start here, if I apply or if I supply some kind of a chemical cost, and I want to get here where I get structures that grow like e effective and g effective. Um, what we had, uh, what uh, you know, the relative entropy uh, that we wrote down, um, that I don't have over here, that that we wrote down in the in the in the, in the previous two slides, actually uh, has an interpretation in terms of these uh, effective energies. So it turns out that the d object that we wrote down is basically uh, a difference of of uh, of energies. Uh, minus a difference of free energies, and this object must be sort of you know it's it, it, this is an object again that shows up whenever you look at second law of thermodynamics. It turns out the the interpretation of this object is as follows: let's 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 imagine that you have an energy surface that's this E effective energy surface, and you uh, you know imagine a uh, imagine a process in which you switch the Hamiltonian from E effective to E equilibrium one step, okay. And you compute the amount of work you're doing in this process. The average amount of work you do is nothing but delta E, this process. This is delta F. And the relative entropy term that we wrote out before has an interpretation that's basically uh, you know, the work minus the free energy difference in this imaginary one-step process. Okay? Um, and you know, so this W minus delta F like terms, they, they, you know, we know from textbook treatments of the second law that W minus delta F uh, or the work minus free energy difference is nothing but uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, is, is is nothing but the increase in the entropy of the, of the universe uh, in in a, in a, a non-equilibrium process. And so again, you know, this is just a new way of looking at it. Or there's, there's not much new here. It's just a different way of looking at it. Sorry, um, that you can take these d objects, which which have information theoretic meaning, and convert them back into things that look like energies. And then uh, this this d then has the meaning of uh, you know the amount of dissipation that is incurred if you want to take a system that looks like this and convert it to a system that looks like this. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of rough physical meaning that you that that, that you can associate with this with this D object. And the second law of thermodynamics uh, applied to these growing processes basically tells you that the chemical potential that you have to supply or the, or the amount of energy that you need to pump in has to exceed this cost. Okay, so once you account for all the entropy balances, uh, delta mu minus this has to be positive, or else the net entropy of the universe is going to go down. This has an obvious interpretation in terms of work and energies, and I've just explained that the second term, which is the, the, the relative entropy term, also has 
and interpretation uh, you know, in terms of work and, uh, and energies. Okay, so so I've, I've sort of run through a few things. It's sort of easy to derive this. It's not, uh, there's no sleight of hand here. It's, 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 it's extremely straightforward. Uh, but uh, you can again take the Kullback leader divergence and, 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 and convert it into quantities that are uh, textbook thermodynamic um, ideas. Okay, and now this brings me, brings me to uh, the second thing that you can do, and this is this is a re really cool result that has been around just for two three years now, um, uh, or the, this this extension. Um, and uh, let me try to motivate it. So you know, in this in this we're just saying that the 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 net entropy of the universe has to be positive. Okay. Um, but we know from ideas like fluctuation theorems and so on and so forth, we know that there are higher symmetries that, that constrain the fluctuations of, of entropies and so on and so forth. Okay. And one recent result that has come out, which is, which is really remarkable, is, um, is the following. So let's, let's, look at, um, let's look at the entropy production or fluctuations in entropy production, but let's look at it close to equilibrium. Let's look at it at linear response. Okay. Um, let, me, let me go to that. Uh, we just talked about these things. Uh, so close to linear response, uh, we expect the, the average growth rate to be, to be proportional to uh, the, the, the fluctuations uh, in, the, in the density of the system. So, so if, I, if I were to watch this polymer um, uh, when it is not growing or when it's growing very slowly, the average growth rate in some sense we expect it to be proportional to the innate fluctuations that are sort of, uh, you know, that, that, that actually show up in the system. Okay, that's, 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 that's another way of saying fluctuation dissipation uh, theorems. Now most of you, yeah, so that's sort of, that's sort of the basic picture over here. Um, what people have shown recently is that, um, in fact, even if you go far, if you go far from equilibrium, the fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, no longer is an equality, but it actually becomes an inequality. Okay. So, uh, you know, coming back to coming back to what I have over here, this is what we know from the second law. We know that the second law states that the entropy has to be positive. We know that close to linear response, the average in Entropy production rate is equal to the second cumulant of the entropy production fluctuations. That's what we know from linear response of fluctuation dissipation theorems. Um, it turns out that that same result uh, becomes an inequality if you go far from equilibrium. And uh, again, I'll sort of I'm just putting this up there right now. This is this is a result, uh, and I'll show you who derived it. It was uh, uh, Barato uh, and Udo Seifert, uh, and uh, you know first postulated this result. And uh, uh, Todd Gingrich, Jordan Horowitz, and Jeremy England uh, proved this result in a very general setting. Um, and so it, it, it basically tells you that you can take these fluctuation dissipation theorem like ideas, and you can ask what happens when you go far from equilibrium. And it turns out that the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which people have basically ignored when you go far from equilibrium, because they, you know, there's not much structure that seems to be left in there, but it looks like that becomes an inequality. And what, uh, what that gives us, without, without going into all the mathematical details, is that it tells us that this entropy production rate, uh, which we wanted to be positive, has to actually exceed uh, a, a non-negative number. Okay, so it gives us a much tighter bound on, uh, on, um, uh, on, on, on the kind of structures that are, that are allowed because, you know, uh, I know what delta mu is. That's something I, I put in. Um, and these quantities I can actually, I can actually predict if I, if I were to measure, you know, the average transfer properties. If I were to measure the average growth rate or the average rate of translation and the, and the fluctuations of the translation, I can measure these quantities. And, you know, instead of this thing just being greater than zero, which would have given us a bound on the kind of structures that I could have found, or it would have given us a bound on the kind of error rates that you would have found, uh, the fact that this thing has to be greater than zero now gives, gives you a much tighter bound. You have, you have to include information about these transport properties. Um, but it gives you a much tighter bound on the kinds of structures that are allowed, and it gives you much more. Uh, it, it, it allows you to use all these modern non-equilibrium ideas uh, to come up with, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a tighter sort of design principles to understand how how you can how you can you know get to the uh, conditions uh, you actually want. Okay, so 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 this relation looks it 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 looks like a mess, but the, but the content in this basically is the, is that you know fluctuation dissipation theorem, te theorem tells us that the average entropy production is proportional to the uh, uh, the second cumulant of the entropy production rate at close to equilibrium. If you go far, uh, that becomes an inequality, and that's sort of where this thing uh, emerges. So that's that, that's the basic con uh, information, uh, and after that, there's a small, small amount of mess mess to um, to to get to this point. Okay, so what I'll do now is, um, uh, is yep, which one? 
So, 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 this, this, so this whole thing goes to zero as you approach equilibrium. Because, because you, you know, you know this, 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 this object goes to zero as you approach equilibrium, this object goes to zero as you approach equilibrium, and the whole limit goes to zero as you, as you approach equilibrium. Uh, there are, there are, there are uh, you know, this was derived for uh, non equilibrium processes that, uh, that are built upon uh, Poisson rates. So as long as you have Poisson rates of addition and removal, which is sort of where most of most systems or most models are, uh, it turns out that this thing is actually true. <coughs> yeah. So, so, so if uh, if you have uh, other, you know, so 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 let's say you have you have a you have a new rule to add and subtract. If you can decompose that, or if there's a limit by this Poissonian, this will still work. Uh, but but uh, in limits that are not, and I don't know, I don't know. Uh, of examples where that's, I, I know of a couple examples where, where that's the case, but in most cases, you, we end up having Poisson processes at least in some limit. So, you know, even if I look at, um, you know, let's say I don't have, uh, uh, let's say I make measurements that are not sufficiently coarse grained, uh, or, or sorry, uh, measurements that are not sufficiently fine grained, I might end up, end up with processes that have memory and so on and so forth, but almost always you can sort of, you know, keep fine graining the measurements to get to, 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 to get to fundamental physical processes that have Poisson statistics, and then this thing seems to be valid. Okay. Um, sorry, what? They have, they have, they have stronger versions of this, yes. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm Exactly. Exactly. So, 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 so it turns out that that there is a deeper set of symmetries in terms of the full large deviation function uh, for entropy production, and, and I, I haven't explained what those words are, which I will try to do later on if possible. Um, but yeah, so, so it uh, there is a deeper set of symmetries that uh, are related to um, cumulants or you know higher order cumulants of, of S. Um, and it turns out that they have to satisfy a particular constraint. Now it's not again it's not clear if how, it's not clear how useful this will be. Um, but it turns out that you know applying or adding these adding these adding these fluctuations actually gets us uh, results that are much better than just having the second law like thing. But 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 even 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 with all that, the basic point uh, the basic point here is that you know uh, we um, we can write down this version of the second law. This this all the information about the eta, the object that we want to control or measure, uh, is actually in this object epsilon dissipation, which is a relative entropy, uh, which is the information theoretic uh, uh, number that we have, we spoke about yesterday and that we spoke, we, we spent quite some time about today. Um, and this bound in some sense is a bound that doesn't have any kinetic information, right? So it doesn't depend on how you add and move things, and it depends only on, you know, transport properties that you can measure, um, and, uh, and that's about it. Right? So, so it doesn't have it doesn't have uh, uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't have any other features, and so it's very attractive. It's not clear how useful this is, but it's attractive. It looks like this is the kind of framework uh, that will actually allow us to go beyond what we wrote down yesterday with the with the with the with the, with the BRLX setup, uh, where we uh, uh, where we sh where, where we showed that uh, fluctuation dissipation uh, uh, relations uh, constrain uh, errors. Maybe this is the way to sort of think about what happens if you add uh, these non equilibrium forces. So what I'll do now is. Um, uh, I will uh, work through uh, what looks like an exactly solved model. Um, so this 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 will have some more information. Or it'll have some more complexity than what I had over here, um, and I'll sort of show you how this actually works out, just to give you a flavor. And I'll introduce a few more terms. Um, and after that, if time permits, I will start. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to proofreading in this lecture, or else uh, you know we'll start the proofreading part in the lecture today after. You had a question, Bill? I'm sorry, it might, yeah, it might be a typo. Yeah, this is the thing, so it's, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, I, th I think I, I added a delta n in two places. I, uh, I, put, I put one over here, I'm gonna put one over here. I, used the, the, I think the factors of time work out, but I might have, I might have messed something with time and everything. Okay. Um, okay. So, so it, this is a model that's very similar to what I had over here you know, when you talked about proofreading, um, but just that I'm going to put energies in. I'm going to sort of go into some into some gory detail, uh, and this is related to, uh, in part, to the problem that I uh, 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 I gave in the in the in the handout. Um, so again, let's say I have these two kinds of uh, I have these two kinds of blocks, um, and uh, you know, let's say I have some kind of interactions, and this these interactions are uh, you know similar to what we discussed before. Uh, the red blocks uh, right to be uh, like to be next to red blocks. Uh, the blue blocks right uh, like to be next to blue blocks. Uh, the red block doesn't like to be next to the blue block. Um, and the energy of interaction between the red and the red is epsilon s. 
the red and the blue is epsilon d, um, and uh, and I want to see what happens if I if I grow this polymer uh, out of equilibrium. Okay, so so I want to be able to predict the kinds of uh, uh, patterns that are formed. I want to be able to predict, or I want to see what I can predict actually in this case. Okay, um, so uh, so let's say I have a dilute concentration of uh, of blocks in in uh, in in uh, in solution. Uh, the chemical potential is nothing but minus kBT. The, the, the temperature times the log of the concentration. This tells me uh, you know the affinity. Uh, the, 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 this the, this tells me uh, you know the. Uh, you know how close the system is to saturation, or how close the system is to nucleation, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, you know, if I know the chemical potential, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of start imagining a specific microscopic process. I'm going to imagine a microscopic process in which I add blocks to the assembly at a rate that's proportional to the exponential of minus beta mu, where mu is the chemical potential. And again, this is just my, um, it's something that I uh, decide to do. One can, one can come up with uh, other kinds of rules, or one can come up with, with a different prescription. It's just something that I, you know, I just, I just uh, want these set of kinetic parameters for now. Um, so I add blocks to this assembly at, with, with this kind of decrete, and I remove blocks from this assembly at a rate that's proportional to uh, the energy of interaction. So if I want to remove this blue block, uh, I, the rate at which I remove the blue block is going to be proportional to the, ex, uh, to the exponential of minus beta times epsilon d, because that's the cost I need to pay in order to break a bond. And uh, so that's what's going to happen. So this, in some sense, maps onto the proofreading kind of idea, but it's just one dimensional, and uh, there's no polymer walking around. Uh, and it, but it has the same flavor uh, as, as, as uh, uh, it has a lot of the same flavor as, as, as proofreading. Okay. So if I, um, if I grow the system in equilibrium, and what I mean by equilibrium here is very simple. Um, if I tune the chemical potential uh, such that, uh, and this is something that we know from equilibrium statistical mechanics, if I tune the chemical potential uh, to the to the value such that it's equal to the derivative of the free energy of this of this of this of this one uh, d uh, of this one dimensional chain, and it works out to this. Uh, it, it works out. It's 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 a it's very simple algebra to, uh, to, uh, to do this. If you if you tune the chemical potential to this to this number, um, and what happens then is that the uh, free energies are balanced, um, and the the cost uh, to add uh, or remove a particle is exactly balanced out by by the change in the free energy system as you as you change the number of particles. Okay, so that's what I've done. In this case, it's one dimensional. One can go ahead and compute the partition function in equilibrium, and you can work this out. That's how you get this coexistence chemical potential. So if I if if you were to tune the system to this value of the chemical potential, it's going to grow very slowly, or it's actually going to not grow at all. If you tune it just off the coexistence, it's going to grow very slowly. The bounds will be close to saturated at this point, um, and uh, you know it's, it, you, you end up getting patterns that look uh, that can be predicted by equilibrium thermodynamic theories. That, that can be predicted by you know, things like eta equilibrium. In this context, it turns out that, uh, and as most of you would have guessed, you know, I can map this onto uh, what looks like a 1D IC model. Uh, red blocks are like upspins, blue, blue blocks are like downspins. There's, a, there's an effective coupling constant. That's simply the difference of uh, these two energy scales divided by two. Um, and uh, you know uh, this eta equilibrium that we have over here is nothing but the probability of of having a defect in a, a 1D Ising model, which I can get from this J answer. So it's a, so it's a very simple it's a very simple mapping. It's nothing uh, nothing fancy over here. But if it's an equilibrium, uh, you know, and if you give me epsilon s epsilon d, uh, I can tell you what the chemical potential should be for no growth, and I can tell you what this number should be. So that's that's the state we have. That's the state we have control over. I can control the state by controlling epsilon s and, and epsilon d. So now, now what we want to do is, uh, is we want to grow this thing rapidly. Okay? Uh, and again, my growth over here is, is, uh, is by changing the concentrations. Uh, it's not the kind of growth that happens in proofreading. It's a different kind of growth, but still it's out of equilibrium, and we can you know, think about the same kind of ideas. So, so, so now let's say I sort of start growing this rapidly. I, I change my chemical potential such that it's off coexistence. It's below the coexistence chemical potential. So I have a large concentration of monomers in solution, and they keep adding at a rate that's faster than the rate of removal. So the whole system grows at a at a at a finite rate, and we can we can intuitively see what's going to happen because you grow at a finite rate. You're going to sort of pump more errors into this thing, right? You're going to have more. Uh, bonds between red and blue than you would if you grow slowly. So in some sense, this is the opposite limit of proofreading, um, but that's fine. I mean, I just want to sort of, we just want to understand uh, how we can go out of equilibrium and still measure things, yeah? 
didn't have a template, but, uh, but it, have an error when, when the flows are Exactly, exactly. So, so there's no template over here. Uh, everything is contained in this, uh, you know, the, the notion of an error is simply a bond between unlike blocks. Okay? Um, and in some sense, you can, you know, if, if, if I remove the template out of the proofread, of the proofreading uh, ideas, and if I simply think about, uh, you know, error or, you know, states with errors and states, states without error, you can map it on, you can, you can effectively map it onto this, and you can think about it in, this, in, 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 the, in, the, in the same manner. Um, the, the template sort of has complexity in that there are you know multiple right entries and multiple wrong entries. Oh, sorry, there's one one right entry and multiple wrong entries. Over here, there's only one right and one wrong. Okay, so so that that combinatorial factor goes away, but apart from that, it's basically the same uh, problem. Okay, all right. So so I'm going to grow this at a rapid rate, and I'm uh, my, the way uh, you know the the work I do is the work required to maintain a constant concentration. That's the pump that's uh, that's keeping the system going. If the concentration of monomers and solution uh, you know, keep getting depleted, then uh, the system is going to stop. It, 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 it won't grow, and it sort of relaxes back to equilibrium. But there is some pump out there uh, which maintains this a constant chemical potential, and it keeps, you know, keeps the system growing. There's a constant growth front. Okay? Uh, and so what we are going to do is we're going to look over here. We're going to look deep inside over here. And uh, we want to see if, uh, you know, we, we want to make some statements about what's going on, what kind of compositions are settling in here, what's, what are the correlations that sort of settle in here away from the growth front. If this were equilibrium, we could predict it, but now, it, you know, this, you know, predicting what's going on here, at least a first guess would require, you know, it would seem to require knowledge of all the kinetic parameters and so on and so forth, but we'll try to, we'll try to see if we can use these information theoretic ideas to actually predict what goes in here and to see if we can, you know, get, to, get bounds that are useful in the first place. Okay, uh, so in order to do that, I'll sort of go to this effective Hamiltonian picture I talked about. It's 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 exactly like the relative uh, like the relative entropy picture, um, and so I start off with the J, which is an Ising coupling constant, uh, a nearest neighbor Ising coupling constant. And what I'm going to ask is, as I grow this out, uh, let's say that the patterns that are formed uh, are characterized by uh, uh, an Ising model with a new coupling constant, J effective, and I'm going to assume this was simplicity that this Ising model is a nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor Ising model. It's something that you can, you know, it's a, it's a variational thing that you can throw in there in the whole information theoretic, uh, uh, you know, result for the entropy. But for now, I'll just assume that it's a nearest neighbor Ising model, and uh, I have a coupling constant J effective that sort of, um, you know, I, I want to use to parameterize the kind of configurations and correlations and structures that are formed in here. Okay. Um, and this J effective can be inverted to give the average domain lens uh, inside uh, in, in, inside these regions, and you can and you can use the average domain lens to to work out what your effective error rates are in some sense. Because the larger your domain lens, the lower your your error rates, and so you can sort of go back and forth between these two things. And so the game I'm going to try to play is you know I know the average domain lens, so I, I use this C to denote a domain length in equal uh, to, to denote domain lens. I know what this is in equilibrium. Um, can I predict what it looks like out of equilibrium? Um, and can I use this, this information theoretic ideas to actually get really good estimates for how this domain length is modified when you go far from equilibrium, in the, in the absence of any kinetic information? Okay? Um, and these are the bounds we are going to use. Uh, you know, this is the, this is the, this is again the second law that we sort of wrote down. Uh, I, I've, I've stopped writing down the relative entropy. Uh, explicitly here, but this epsilon dissipation is nothing but the, the, the relative entropy concept that, that we spent uh, most of our time on. Okay, um, and so the game we're going to try to play is, you know, can we can we actually estimate J effective, or in other words, can we estimate the the average domain lens inside a growing non equilibrium system by using this information theoretic ideas? Okay. All right. So uh, these are results from simulations and some theory. These are very simple simulations. You can do them in a couple of hours or they're very simple simulations. So, um, so what I have here is, is the response of the system. So I have delta mu over here. So this is the uh, this is the chemical potential that 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 I've imposed. Uh, and again, all this is just an excuse for me to think about proofreading, but in, the, in, a, in a more abstract concept where uh, where I'm just growing out things from solution. Okay. So I have a delta mu over here. This is my excess chemical potential. My equilibrium point is way over here, where delta mu is zero. And so this point, the domain lengths are really large. So the system sort of likes to form very, very large regions of all red or all blue with very small, uh, you know, numbers of uh, defects. And as you scale delta mu up, as you sort of increase the driving force, in this case, the response is that the system becomes more and uh, you know, starts getting more and more errors. So this is the opposite limit of proofreading, but we just want to see if we can use these information theoretic ideas to make predictions right now. Okay, so the errors keep increasing, the domain lens keeps shrinking as you as you add uh, as you keep 
pumping up delta mu, okay, as you keep doing it uh, more and more rapidly. And um, if I use the first bound, so the first variational bound that I wrote down, so this is this the second law of thermodynamics applied to self-assembly, applied to these non euclidean processes, I, I, get, uh, I get this blue line over here, okay? And so what this tells me is that, or you know, if, I apply the, if I apply the bounds, it tells me that, uh, the, 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 the second law tells me that everything in this very small region is not allowed, and everything in this big giant region is allowed. So it doesn't give us a lot of useful information. information. It basically sort of outlines for you this very, very, uh, very weak bound, um, uh, and it tells you that anything above here is allowed, anything over here is not allowed. Okay, uh, and this is the uh, this is the information theoretic bound. So, so we are using the mutual information to make predictions. Uh, it looks, you it, know, it does a reasonable job maybe over here, but it certainly sort of starts to flake out really fast as you as you go out of equilibrium. Now, what happens if I if I if I add these uh, you know if I if I add these transport properties? Uh, I still have this mutual information in, uh, but I can add the transport properties and I can go to my new bound, which is which may be more effective. And this is what you get. It's already doing a much better job. Um, so this it tells you that anything inside this is not allowed, and everything over here is allowed. Um, and so this tells you that you know by using these ideas, uh, which, which come from very simple uh, information theoretic considerations, without any detailed knowledge of how I'm adding or how I'm removing uh, things from the system, I can already get a reasonable, reasonable intuition for how the system behaves. Okay, so, so if I just have bits, if, if, I, if I just sort of have the, the vanilla version, that doesn't seem to do, do, do really well, but if I have bits plus something, I, I, I get reasonably good estimates for, for, uh, for, for how the system behaves as it's growing out of equilibrium. And uh, you know, the, the, all this is a variational game, so we can play the variational game in many different ways. So if you play the variational game in a slightly more clever way, you get, you get a result that looks like this orange, I think, I'm colorblind, so some, some line there, but there's this line over here. Um, and uh, it tells you that anything below this orange line is not allowed, but this orange line basically sort of gets the response right uh, as you drive the system out of equilibrium. It's, it, it, it's able to predict the response all the way from here to here, and then it starts to deviate. And, and this information theoretic bound gives you reasonably good information for, uh, for, how, uh, for the kinds of patterns that are formed uh, without any detailed kinetic information that you know for how the system adds and those things. So, so again, you know, I want to sort of bring this back to where we started yesterday. Uh, when we started yesterday, we sort of worked out this back of the envelope calculation for uh, uh, fluctuations in concentration or errors in fluctuations in concentration. And the the result that we first worked out was that the errors in concentration fluctuations seem to depend only on system properties, they, they seem to depend on diffusion, morphology, uh, sorry, the, the, the size roughly of the, of the receptor. Um, and if, you know, once we sort of dug deeper, it turned out that that was due to the fluctuation dissipation relation and it sort of gave these beautiful bounds that was insensitive to the details of the system. And similarly over here, it looks like, uh, you know, by applying ideas from, from information theory, you know, uh, with some bells and whistles, we can actually do something similar, although, this problem and the, and the Bialik problem still have, you know, we still have to cover a lot, a lot of distance to go from here to what we did yesterday. But it looks like conceptually we can do something very similar, and we can actually make predictions uh, without detailed kinetic information uh, uh, about how this not about how, about how the non-equilibrium process happens. And we can actually use uh, out of equilibrium forces to guide the system uh, to configurations in a very uh, in a very directed manner. So it looks like you can do it. So it looks like the question we set out to answer yesterday uh, seems to have some resolution, and we'll spend more time on this. So just to convince you that this is not a, this is not complete fluke, you can do the same thing, um, um, you know, with a with a two-dimensional model instead of a one-dimensional model. So this has phase transitions. It has uh, large correlations. Correlations. It has many more things. Um, and uh, you know we can sort of go through the same kinds of uh, kinds of ideas. Uh, uh, we can th there's an equilibrium point. There is epsilon s, epsilon d. There's a uh, there is the the, the, the whole phenomenology. Uh, and let me let me just show you results again from a very simple simulation, just to sort of uh, uh, whet your interest about what actually happens here. So uh, what I'm going to show you are uh, are are how these are how is how this block grows as you tune the non-equilibrium driving force. So over here, the driving force is very low, so this is close to equilibrium. I start off with all red, and I basically remain at all red. Over here, this is really fast, and you'll see that you know you start off with all red, but you, but you start seeing interfaces, and you start seeing 
phenomenology that looks very similar to what you see close to critical points. Okay. Uh, uh, yep. In both these cases, the one DM, yeah. if you set the, your kind of energies for say uh, F1 D and F1, you can have phase transition. Or in the 1D you can't. Even in the 1D? In, in the 1D there's no phase transition. Right, so the 1D entropy always wins over. Uh, the 1D entropy always wins over, so, the, the, so there are no phases. There are no uh, phases except at zero temperature, uh, because we, we only have we only have finite we only have finite interaction ranges. Okay, so if 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 I were to do the same thing with like an infinite interaction range, then I could have a phase transition, or if I would go to zero temperature, I'd have a phase transition. But classical 1D, there are no phase transitions uh, because entropy just wins over and destroys everything. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so right now, you know, if I start with all red, the system, because you know, red likes red, it, it stays in all red. If I want to sort of go from red to blue, it has to cross a barrier of some sort, right? Uh, and over here, you'll see that I start in all red, and uh, over here, it stays all red. Over here, you start in all red, and you start seeing these islands of blue. Over here, you start in all red, but you see these very large islands of blue. You see these, you know, large. Uh, patterns that seem to emerge as you go along. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, uh, in, 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 the, in the details of this. Uh, you know, this has, uh, again, I, I sort of threw this picture up before of dendrites and nucleation and so on and so forth. And so I just wanted to sort of point out that there is, again, connections between, uh, uh, you know, these kinds of structures and the kind of dendrite structures that you see. Uh, so this is prototypical non ethereum growth kind of uh, ideas. And the question, again, is can we predict this? Can we actually go ahead and, you know, uh, predict this kind of a response. Now this is obviously going beyond what we did in proofreading because it's not just a one-dimensional object anymore. We're actually predicting an object that's uh, that has, you know, large correlation lengths that's two-dimensional. It's 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 tough to characterize. It's, I can't just think of uh, defects anymore. Uh, I have a much more complicated system. And uh, the question is, can we use information theory uh, to actually, uh, you know, get, uh, get uh, predict structures of this sort also? Okay, um, so uh, you know, just one more thing that that uh, that was recently worked out, and this is this is in the context of non-Euclidean self-assembly, and this is two beautiful set of papers by Steve Whitelam at uh, at Berkeley. Uh, so Steve was the one who sort of uh, looked at the 1D model that I showed you, um, and who also looked at the 2D model that I'm showing you right now. Uh, he looked at he, you know they did, they did simulations of these of these two models and found that as you drive the system out of equilibrium in the in the 2D context, you can actually effectively heat it up. So you can take a system that's initially far from criticality, and by driving it out of equilibrium by changing the delta mu, you can effectively heat it up and you can take it close to criticality. So what I have here is the fluctuations in magnetization, and for the, for the experts in the audience, uh, you know, a peak in the fluctuation, uh, the peak in the susceptibility is related to uh, 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 a critical point. And you know, you can take a system that's actually far from criticality, you can grow it more and more rapidly, and what you get is a state that is not just noise, it's not just complete noise, that's what happens in 1D, you go to a state that's just noise. In the, in the 2D case, you, you, you go to a state that has very large correlation lengths, uh, and, you, and you get fluctuations that look like critical fluctuations. Okay, uh, and again, this is this point is not very important. It's just for the experts in the audience who care about um, uh, uh, these kind of things. The the, the 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 central message is that the the face picture here is much more complicated. It has many more moving parts. Yep. So, yes. Yes. Exactly. So, 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 what's going on over here is you grow this out for a long amount, and uh, you look at some probe volume inside, and you look at the fluctuations inside the probe volume. If I, if, if you do many, many ensembles, okay, or if you do a large, large number of these things, uh, and then that's how you construct this thing. But yeah, I, I've assumed the things are frozen in here. Okay, if, if, if they, if they, if they don't freeze, then, then all this goes away and it sort of relaxes back to where it can. But you know, keeping with uh, standard crystal growth or keeping with how things happen in biology, once you have a defect, it gets, you know, gets built in. Yep. Yes, uh, so, 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 so that's a good point. So it turns out that in two dimensions, the, these, exp oh, okay, so you, you, you get exponents that are really close to it. I don't think they did, a, I don't think they measured it very carefully yet, at least up to 2014, uh, but, but, uh, but you get exponents that are really close to what you expect in two dimensions. Uh, but as you know, uh, it's tough, I mean, it's, it, they're, they're still rational, um, and uh, it's, it's not, I mean, yeah, it's, it's close. It's not. It's not clear if it's if it's exactly that or not. Um, 
uh, I, you know, in the figures that I showed you, it's clear that in you know, everything it's stretched out. So it's not. Uh, I think it belongs to the, belongs to the 2D uh, Ising class, uh, but I don't think they did, did a full job of testing that out yet. Yep. Yeah. So this is like the finite size scaling. So this is the three different three different uh, box sizes, and you sort of see this thing. So I just threw that up here. Yep. And again, assume the maybe correctly, you can just have the equilibrium. Exactly. 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 Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, so, you could do the same thing. Uh, you know, instead of tuning delta mu, which is a, which is my non-equilibrium driving force, I could just tune j, the coupling constant, and I, I could get a curve that looks like this. Uh, and can you tell the difference at all? Uh, you can if you look at the images. So, if you look at the images uh, of this of these systems, you see that over here, you know, um, you see that the system is sort of growing in one direction, and so it sort of leaves an imprint in, along one direction. Okay, so you see that everything is stretched out along one direction. If it's an equilibrium, you sort of see more, more, more symmetric surfaces. So, so that's one thing. And, and, and the second thing is, you know, you have a growth front. The system is always growing over here. In, in equilibrium, it doesn't grow. It sort of, say, it, it sort of reaches a point. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so what I'm doing? Let, let, let me just define what I'm doing here very carefully, and then maybe that answers what you asked right now. So, uh, so, the, so the way this happens, or the way I started off, is uh, you start off with the seed over here. Okay, and you can think of that as a nucleus in some sense, uh, but but you're way past any critical nucleus point here because you, you have you have, you have, have supersaturation, so the whole thing is going to grow in any case. So you have the seed and blow this out, okay. And what you do is you know you you, you let this grow for quite some time, and then you choose a region over here which is far from this edge and far from the growth edge, okay. And uh, you compute the ma average magnetization. You repeat the experiment again. You grow this out again. Look at the same region, compute the average magnetization, and so you know that's how we, that's how you generate the the graph in the next in the, in the next thing. Okay, so um, that's the setup that's being used at this point, and uh, the fluctuations are basically a proxy for uh, you know, for measuring the correlation lengths that emerge, and I can define correlation lengths here and so on and so forth. Does, does it answer what your, your question, or uh, does it answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so over here, uh, over here, what I haven't told you is that, and because this is a, this is this was sort of inspired by a material science-like uh, model. Uh, once you cross the interface, uh, you can't have any spin flips. So, so, so the relaxation only happens at the interface. It doesn't happen away from the interface. And so, once you get a defect, or once you get, you know, an island of blue over here, which is far from the interface, it gets locked in. Okay. And that, that that's a kinetic rule, we, you know, that they put in to sort of see this kind of a thing. Sorry, what? Yeah. Um, yeah. If 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 you were to grow this slowly, then the kind of phase behavior you would see, the kind of patterns you would see, would exactly be the patterns you would see in equilibrium. So everything that you would get w will show up here. Um, you know, you I I do put this one boundary condition over here, sort of messes things up. But apart from that, everything that you get in equilibrium will show up here. If I grow this slowly, and if you don't, you get things that you know don't look like. Equilibrium because you have growth fronts. Okay, okay. Um, so, okay. So, so uh, again. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a game similar to what we did before. I know we have. Um, so, I want to estimate. I want to sort of come up with a J effective, which I can come up with, um, and I estimate what this J effective is as a function of delta mu from 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 simulations. Uh, and this is from simulations that you know that I showed you before. Um, and you get a response that looks like this. It looks like a, a lot like the response in the one-dimensional case. You start off, um, you know, at the value close to where you, you know, uh, to, to what you said. And as you tune delta mu higher and higher, you reach this line. And this line is basically the critical point, the orthogonal critical point for the 2D Ising model. Okay. 
Um, so this is what happens if you do a simulation and you do this thing. If you now use the information theoretic bounds that I, uh, that I wrote down, the first bound gives you this black line. So it tells you anything over here is not allowed, everything over here is allowed. So it gives you, it, it does a reasonable job. It sort of gives you a rough idea for, for what you need to do in order to take the system from here to here. Um, but it doesn't do, obviously, you know, it doesn't give, doesn't get a lot of the specifics, right? Uh, and if you now apply this bound with uh, the kinetic information or the kinetic uh, uh, fluctuations, um, in the in the in the uh, transport properties, you, you you get a response that that basically almost gets it right. So the, so this is a system which is 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 much more complicated than this. But the point of all this was just to, just to sort of argue that one can use these information theoretic ideas uh, without any kinetic information uh, or system specific information and get reasonably good predictions for how the system responds when it's growing far from equilibrium. Okay, so 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 uh, you know the the. The, these relative entropy uh, objects that have this information theoretic flavor in terms of distances and everything surprisingly show up here, and they and bits in this context do seem to matter a lot. Bits plus this information, but but uh, you know uh, knowledge of bits seems to give seems to uh, uh, contain a lot of information about the kind of compositions and structures that, that the system can actually adopt. Okay. It, 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 comes, it comes close to it. So uh, this bound predicts something over here, and the actual answer is something so you, over you here. Send it further to the right. Will it go to zero? Or will it uh, so, 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 so the critical point is yeah, so, so, so beyond a point, it turns out that you know, one can't apply the Onsaga solution. So actually, anything beyond this line is, is nonsense in this, in this case. Uh, but so, so in some sense, the black line predicts a critical point here, and the blue line predicts a critical point here. Uh, but yeah, so, you know. Uh, Given the minimal amount of information that you put into this thing, uh, it's surprising that information theory kind of ideas actually get you this much uh, 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 purchase for um, for the for the system. So um, you know, one can do something. One can sort of look deeper in this, and you can actually go ahead and extract the entire distribution of fluctuations inside the growing assembly. Uh, and this is just sort of to dig deeper and to sort of see how much information is contained in these in these kinds of uh, in these kinds of bounds. Um, so the red line is what you what you get if you do a simulation, um, and the blue line is sort of what information theory theory sort of predicts. Okay, so so it, it does a remarkable job again of. Uh, of predicting this entire distribution. So this is the probability of magnetization inside some probe volume-like region. Um, and it's able to get this peak. It's able to get most of the rare events and everything in between. Um, and all this comes, uh, you know, I haven't really, I haven't gone, gone into, the, into the details of the, of the derivation to sort of show you how uh, the relative entropy showed up in this, in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, setup here. I think Juan will do it when he does the fluctuation theorems. Uh, you'll talk a bit more about uh, dissipation and and and, and uh, mutual information and everything. Um, so it might it'll, it'll it'll show up again over there, and I'll talk about it today afternoon if possible. But the point of this is just that you know you can you can basically uh, predict non-equilibrium self-assembly uh, using using these remarkably simple ideas. So just to wind up, um, what what we started off with. Is, a, is, a, is some kind of a landscape, and this is uh, in this in this case I've sort of drawn out a landau ginzburg uh, double well potential, and uh, and uh, what I have tried to argue is that you can sort of use non-equilibrium forces to to modify the landscape. You can sort of take it from this black line to this red line, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, you can actually and no so so the fact that you can do this the fact that you can take the take it from the take the system from the black line to the red line when you start driving a lot of equilibrium that by itself is not surprising because you know sure you drive a lot of equilibrium you get responses that you know no longer match your intuition uh, no, no longer conform to uh, the intuition you have from from fluctuations about the black line but you can use these ideas which are which are rooted in in, in information theory uh, to predict the kind of structures that emerge. Um, even in systems that are have large correlations that are close to criticality, uh, that are really messy, uh, you can use these kind of ideas to, to predict the kind of structures that emerge. Um, and so, you know, using information in combination or information theory in combination with the second law of thermodynamics, it, it just it, it it doesn't just give you loose bounds. It gives you bounds that are actually meaningful. And in all this, the the, the point that I want to convey over and over again is that it looks like. Uh, if you think about these problems carefully, bits do do matter in uh, in chemical and biophysical contexts. And in fact, you can sort of you can you can transfer the, you can transfer that information or leverage that information to make real predictions for the kinds of structures that emerge in in biophysical and chemical systems. Um, so uh, I'll end with this. Uh, many people are sort of looking at. Um, 
self assembly in uh, you know uh, so i talked about self assembly in the biological in the biological context there are self assembly problems uh, that people do with dna origami uh, that uh, that people do with colloids and so on and so forth um, and you know apart from the biophysical ideas over here it would be really cool to see if these information theoretic ideas actually can be applied uh, to self assembly processes in other aspects of you know stack mech and material science so let me let me stop over there um, i talked about landscapes in general and, and talked about how they how they get how they get deformed out of equilibrium and how you can use the 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 concepts that one and i introduced yesterday to make real predictions um, and in the next part that i'll be talking about today afternoon i'll talk i'll, I'll come back to information processing and uh, and, and we'll end there thanks Yep. Yes. So, so the, no. So, so, so yeah. So, so that temperature is just a scale that I put in. So, so let's say there's a bath and that has a temperature scale. I just, I just plug that in everywhere. Uh, if you don't do that, you get some delta T's, but that just sort of cancels out. So it's just, it's just something that I pick. Yeah. Yep. I'm interested in optimizing the. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 in some sense, in some sense, the 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 inform the the bounds that I had before. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so basically, you know, this bound, for instance, you can actually start you can start using it to optimize uh, trade-offs between information processing rate and error rate, uh, right? And so we haven't gone there yet, and I don't think people have. But, uh, but yeah. So now one can start using it, and uh, one can do this in a very meaningful manner because you know this statement by itself. doesn't give you any any information about dndt but now by thinking about it in this manner you can you can start playing more games with you know in something that i did with uh, stefan gill on the project we found that in the trade off between energy mm -hmm. uh, waste and mm -hmm. uh, energy expense and uh, time uh -huh. uh -huh. okay okay <laughs> and, and we are more of not completely independent but okay uh, You can optimize uh, velocity and, and, and lose a little bit of energy. I see. I see. I see. I see. I, I haven't. I haven't thought very carefully about it, but I think one can start ask, asking those questions in a general context in this kind of a, in this kind of a setup. But I haven't thought carefully about it yet. Uh, we're more. Yeah. That's that's a good point. One should. That that will be an interesting sort of things one can do with this and everything else. You know. The 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 setups that uh, I described yesterday in terms of just. Uh, measuring concentrations and things like that also yeah yep sorry what i'm sorry yeah should be greater than that like yes yeah Okay. It was less than that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it must be. I have a weird convention. I put, I put negative signs all over the place. And so, so if, if you have noticed, I had a negative sign in the way I defined that. Um, and uh, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thanks. <laughs>